Our classroom stock portfolio of high-yield dividend-paying companies now has an annual return of 32.14%, and it's beating the S&P 500 since the portfolio started. And our dividend growth stock portfolio has an annual return of 20.61%, as the portfolio saw its value jump over $100 this week alone. It, too, is beating the S&P 500. For those that panicked two Mondays ago and got out of stocks, you missed out on some great returns since then. When updating the slide this week, I did a double take when updating the portfolio value as we have not seen a one week increase this large for the dividend growth stock portfolio thus far. Some of the reasons for the portfolio's great week include an 18.9% increase in NVIDIA, a 26% increase in Starbucks, and 12% increases in both Nike and Broadcom. So why did the market bounce back this week? This is according to the Center for Financial Research. And they said this on Thursday, quote, prior to this week, equity markets were recovering from the body blow delivered earlier in the month by data that called into question the economic soft landing thesis and the delay by the Federal Reserve, also called the Fed, in initiating a new rate easing cycle. These uncertainties threw the S&P 500 into an 8.5% decline from the July 16th high. Yet the market's Yet the market has begun to fight its way back to break even, bolstered by Tuesday's softer than expected report from the producer price index, Wednesday's tame reading for the consumer price index, and Thursday's lower than predicted number of initial jobless claims. These metrics were then supported by a higher than forecast growth in retail sales, allowing investors to conclude that the economy re remains resilient, inflation continues its downward glide path, and the outlook for consumer spending is still su supportive, unquote. All right, that's a long-winded intro. So what is this slide showing? It's showing the portfolio value over time for our main portfolio, which invests almost exclusively in dividend growth stocks. In 2022, we started investing $12.50 each week into the portfolio, and it's now worth $2,317.59 after 137 weeks. Each week, we take that deposit and split it up to buy 10 different dividend-paying stocks, so that's about $1.25 per stock. And in August of last year, we started a second portfolio, this time investing in high-yield dividend-paying stocks. Hi, Professor Rex here. If you're new to my channel, I teach college accounting and I often show my students how to use the accounting concepts that I teach to pick stocks because it grabs the attention of my students and gets them engaged. To show them accounting concepts in action, starting two and a half years ago, each Monday I invest actual real world money, $12.50 per week in their first year, which is roughly the equivalent of $50 each month into 10 different dividend paying stocks. And because those original students are no longer in my class, I decided to make this video series to let them know how our portfolio is doing. Also, viewers can get our progress or can use our progress as inspiration for their savings goals and get ideas of company names that they can do their own research on. There are timestamp links in the description of the video in case you want to just jump to the list of stocks we bought this week or the list of our best performers or any other section of the video. In 2022, the year we started the portfolio, the market did not perform well, but because I do not believe in trying to time the market, we kept buying each week at what turned out to be great prices. Then in 2023, stocks took off. Currently, the portfolio's value is over $2,317. The portfolio's return has been 20.61% per year. Last year, the portfolio's return was 28.6%, which beat the S&P 500. And in the preceding year, the portfolio once again beat the market. In this video, we talk a lot about our dividend growth portfolio and our newer high yield portfolio, which is geared more towards those nearing retirement. The table at the bottom of the slide shows the portfolio comparison when both portfolios existed, because remember, they both had different start times. The high yield portfolio was started in August of last year, and the annualized return so far is 32.14%, which is surprisingly higher than our dividend growth portfolio, which has an annualized return of 23.02% over the same time period. I would expect that the dividend growth portfolio would have the higher return over the long run, especially since the high yield portfolio has zero tech stocks thus far. But time will tell. Now remember, the high yield portfolio has only existed for a little over 12 months, so its annualized return will likely jump up or down, but to a greater extent than our dividend growth portfolio's return. This slide shows the growth of the dividends we've received in our dividend growth stock portfolio. 
The graph shows accumulated dividends we've received thus far. Our dividends for the last quarter increased 51% over the previous quarter, and our dividends this month increased 41% over the same month a year ago. So why do we only invest in dividend-paying stocks in this portfolio? The first reason we stick with dividend-paying stocks is, according to a Hartford study, over the past 50 years, dividend-paying stocks vastly outperform non-dividend-paying stocks. The total return for dividend-paying stocks has been 9.17% per year, but for non-dividend-paying stocks, the average return has been much lower at 4.27%. The study is updated each year and was recently updated to include last year. So go check out the source link that I included at the bottom of the screen. Now, Morningstar also recently released a report that went all the way back to 1927 and came up with the same conclusion. Dividend-paying stocks have a higher return and less volatility than non-dividend-paying stocks. Since 1927, um, stocks have averaged about 10% per year. That second point about having less volatility is probably even more important than the fact that dividend-paying stocks have a higher return. Why is a lower amount of volatility so important? Well, it's much easier to stick with a less volatile investing strategy. The more volatile a strategy is, the more likely you are to panic and sell at the wrong time. So why are dividend paying stocks less volatile? Because most dividend paying companies are making a profit, which is why they have excess cash to pay back to investors. As you can see on the screen, risk and volatility of dividend paying stocks as measured by beta and standard deviation tend to be much lower for dividend paying stocks. And finally, the study also showed that the best performing stocks are dividend paying stocks that increase their dividends, which is why our classroom portfolio only invests in dividend paying stocks that have increased their dividend recently. Now the holy grail of dividend investing is having a stock portfolio that produces two things. One, a growing stream of income that produces enough income to cover your expenses, plus extra cash to cover travel, vacations, luxury purchases, etc. And two, also produces a growing stream of income that also grows faster than the rate of inflation. And dividend paying stocks historically increase their dividends significantly higher than the rate of inflation. This means that quality dividend paying stocks can provide a growing income stream for lifetime. Now, this is in contrast to bonds, which do not raise their payments to bondholders. Here are two examples of stocks growing their dividend payouts over the years. The first is Broadcom. I bought Broadcom, a chip maker, in 2020, just four years ago, for my taxable account. At the time, its yield was 5.01%, meaning for every $100 I had invested in the stock, I would receive $5.01 every year. The company has quickly grown the dividend to the point where the yield, based on the original investment, is now 8.13% only four years later. Of course, investors buying the stock now are not going to get that high of a yield because the stock's price has risen so much. That's why it's important to invest early and be patient. And I fully expect Broadcom to continue to increase its dividends well into the future. And if not, that's why we have constructed a diversified portfolio. This is the power investing in a quality dividend growth company. My second example of a high quality company with a history of raising its dividends is Home Depot. In 2003, when I was attending college, I'd started a dividend stock portfolio for the investment newsletter that I had started at the time. And Home Depot was recommended for that portfolio and is still in the portfolio today. At the time, its yield was a low 0.83%, meaning for every $100 I had invested in the stock, I would receive only 83 cents per year. Seemingly not much to get excited about, but over the years, Home Depot has grown the dividend to the point where the yield, based on the original investment, is now 31.1%. And, like Broadcom, while there are no guarantees, I fully expect Home Depot to continue to grow its dividend well into the future. Of course, investors buying the stock now are not going to get that high of a yield because the stock's price has risen. Again, this is why it's important to buy early and be patient. Now remember, stocks historically have a higher return than bonds and are also riskier than bonds. But you certainly won't find a bond that pays anywhere close to yields on costs that these two stocks are paying. And bonds don't increase their payouts to investors like stocks can and often do. Another reason to own dividend paying stocks is for the potential to generate up to $123,250 of tax-free income each year if you're married and filing jointly. Remember, the ultimate goal of dividend investing is growing your portfolio to a point where it generates enough income each year to live off the dividends. 
And because companies historically increase their dividends above the rate of inflation, you have the ultimate income stream that not only covers your expenses, but grows over time. And if you're married and filing jointly, you can make up a hundred up to $123,250 in qualified dividend income and pay zero federal taxes on those dividends if you have no other income. This is perfect for retirees. If you're single, that amount is $61,625. Those amounts often increase each year as the standard deduction increases and the tax brackets are adjusted. Now, how are those amounts calculated? First, you find the 0% tax bracket for long-term capital gain and then find the standard deduction, which can be located in IRS Publication 505. As you can see, in 2024, the standard deduction increased, meaning that, they can not, meaning that you can potentially earn even more tax-free income from qualified dividends. And then the final step is to take the 0% capital gains amount and add it to the standard deduction, which means we get a final amount of $123,250 that a married couple filing jointly could generate an income from qualified dividends that would be federally tax-free. So why did we choose to invest $12 per week, or excuse me, $12.50 per week, which is essentially the same as $25 per paycheck? Talk about that on the next slide. The main reason why we invest only $12 50 per week into the portfolio is because I wanted to show my accounting students that you don't need to you don't need much to build a diversified stock portfolio. In fact, when I was only making $11,000 per year as an enlisted member of the military, I started my investing journey with only $25 per paycheck. In other words, the equivalent of $12.50 per week. And because my brokerage account Fidelity allows me to buy as little as a dollar per stock, we can quickly and easily create a diversified stock portfolio with little money. Originally, I invested $25 per paycheck into this dividend growth um, portfolio, but found the process to be so fun that I split it up and now invest $12.50 every week. And we boost a contribution once per year by the amount of inflation to, rep to replicate the fact that people's paychecks usually increase at least by the amount of inflation. By the way, I also invest in these same stocks in my retirement portfolio and my taxable brokerage account. The research we discuss in class is the same research I use for myself. Another reason I started with a low investment amount was because one day I was wondering how much a young person, in this case a 17-year-old, needed to invest per week to accumulate a million dollars at retirement. And it turns out it's only $11.74 per week. Of course, since most people's annual salary increases each year by the amount of inflation at the very least, I assumed the contributions would increase by 3% each year, which is around the historical rate of inflation. That means in the second year, it's assumed that the person invested an additional 35 cents each week for a total of $12.09 per week instead of the original $11.74. For our classroom stock portfolio, in year two, we boosted the weekly investment 82 cents for a total of $13.32 per week because inflation was pretty high that year. In year three, inflation wasn't as high, so we boosted the weekly investment by only 49 cents for a total of $13.81 per week. A very popular exchange-traded fund, also called an ETF, that only holds dividend stocks is called the Schwab U.S. Dividend Equity ETF, ticker symbol SCHD. SCHD is a large holding in my personal account, so I've been tracking SCHD's performance closely with our classroom stock portfolio. As of today, our classroom stock portfolio's annual return is 20.61%. If we had instead invested the same exact amounts into SCHD on the same days, the portfolio's return would only be 10.15% per year, a difference of 10.46% per year. Our high yield portfolio is also outperforming SHD, but by an even larger margin of 12.1%. Obviously, there's no guarantee that our portfolio will keep outperforming SHD at such a high rate, but I've been gradually selling off my personal SHD holdings and reinvesting in our classroom stock portfolio. I also prefer our actively managed classroom stock portfolio strategy rather than SCHD's purely algorithmic approach where no one is overseeing the stock selection. SCHD has, at times, had large positions in the stocks that I consider to be value traps, and that's not a good thing. This slide shows our best performing stocks in our dividend growth stock portfolio based on when they were initially purchased. Broadcom, a chip company, it moves to the top of the list with a total return of 198.2% in a little over two years. 
New to the list this week is Fiddy Incorporated, an under-the-radar dividend payer. Its total return so far is 63.7% in less than a year. Finia is a leader in automotive premium fuel systems, electrical systems, and aftermarket parts, and was spun off from Borg Warner. Spinoff stocks historically beat the market by a substantial margin. Stocks in yellow have been sold. I remember that total return includes both the dividends the company has paid as well as the increase in the stock price. Now let's turn our attention to the strategy column, specifically the category called dividend growth stocks. 90% of our investments made in this portfolio were made in these stocks, which means they are high quality stocks with a great track record of increasing their dividend payouts to investors. The other 10% of investments so far have been invested in usually smaller under the radar companies that have recently started paying a dividend. These under the radar dividend paying stocks tend to be riskier because they are usually smaller companies, but studies have shown they historically beat the market averages by a significant amount. This slide shows our best performing stocks this week. We had a fantastic week, so sorry if this slide is hard to read. Um, there's a lot we couldn't even fit on this on this slide. Last week, we saw a 24% increase in Clear Secure Incorporated on one day alone. And this week, we saw the same thing with Starbucks, which saw a one day increase of 24% on Tuesday. For the, week, for the week, Starbucks was up over 26%. NVIDIA for the week came in second with an 18.9% increase, followed by 12% increases in Nike and Broadcom. Here's the usual disclaimer. This presentation is for informational and educational purposes only and is not a recommendation to buy or sell securities or engage in any investment activity. It's all well and fine to get investment ideas from others, but you always need to do your own research. We don't sell stocks often and this week was no exception as we made no sales. Now let's talk about the dividend growth stocks we bought last Monday. Here are my ratings for the top 15 dividend paying stocks this past week. At the request of some viewers, I expanded the list to 15. New to the portfolio for the very first time is MSCI Incorporated, which is in the financial exchange and data sub industry. MSCI is best known for its indexes upon which many ETFs are based. It also provides portfolio risk and performance analytics to the financial industry. We purchased the first 10 stocks on the list that are not in the yellow highlight. The stocks in yellow have already grown to be 4% or more of the portfolio, so we did not invest more in them this week because we want to build a more diversified, less risky portfolio. Remember, each week we buy 10 stocks, and since we're investing such a small amount each week, it means we're buying fractional shares in our Fidelity brokerage account. And for those that have asked, we do not automatically reinvest dividends in the same stock from which the dividend was paid. Instead, each week we're buying the 10 stocks as shown on this slide. We combine the weekly deposit with the dividends that have been paid that week and are sitting in the account as cash. We then take that combined total and split it amongst the 10 stocks that we are purchasing this week. In other words, we, re we reinvest dividends weekly into the 10 stocks that we are purchasing that week. Now, for the sake of convenience, there's nothing wrong with simply turning on the broker's auto reinvest feature, but we think it's more ideal to reinvest in our top stocks each week instead of potentially reinvesting in a stock that is fairly valued as opposed to one that is undervalued. This table on this slide includes a company's sub-industry, how undervalued they are according to our research, their risk rating, quality grade, and dividend yield. The most undervalued stocks last week because remember, these are the stocks from last week that we bought on Monday, appeared to be Bristol Myers, Nike, and PNC Financial. Remember, all these stocks pay a dividend and have recently increased their dividends, and our methodology used here indicates that they're likely to continue to raise dividends. Therefore, this is a dividend growth strategy. The stocks with the highest yields were, in order, Bristol Myers, Faxet, and Nike. On this slide, I want to show the components to our quality grade. Quality wise, we only invest in stocks rated B minus or better for this portfolio for 90% of our purchases. The other 10% so far have been invested in smaller under the radar companies that have recently started paying a dividend. These under the radar dividend paying stocks tend to be riskier because they are smaller companies, but studies have shown they historically beat the market averages by a significant amount. 
all the stocks we bought this week qualify as high quality and are dividend growth stocks, which means they have a history of substantially raising the dividends that they pay to their shareholders. Risk is the first quality component which we mentioned on the previous slide. The next quality component is competitive advantage. Obviously, the more competitive advantages a company has, the better investment candidate they are. Next quality component attempts to evaluate the company's management. Our, evalu our evaluation includes both management's use of capital and general decision making, but also our research dives deep into accounting data to look for red flags in the company's accounting practices, as well as the quality or reliability of their reported earnings. Earnings, of course, are called profits. And finally, the last quality component is financial health. If you're looking for lower risk stocks, I would suggest looking at American Express, Nike, Microsoft, and FactSet. Remember that the risk rating is comparing these stocks to other stocks, not to other investments like bonds or CDs. The companies earning the highest financial health ratings this week are Applied Materials, MasterCard, Visa, and Microsoft. Now let's look at the dividend growth grades of the companies. Remember, historically, the best performing stocks are those that both pay a dividend and have grown their dividend recently. As you can see under the grade called Grade for Recent Dividend Growth and Current Yield, the stocks with the best combination of dividend growth and a higher yield are Bristol-Myers, Lamb Research, Raymond James, MSCI, and PNC Financial. All these earned an A or A-plus grade. Ideally, you want a higher dividend high recent dividend growth, and the best potential for future dividend growth. But that's not the way it works. Companies that are already paying out higher dividends rarely have the greatest potential for the greatest growth in those dividends. In our list, as you can see from the last grade, dividend growth potential, the companies in the best position to increase their dividends substantially are Bristol-Myers, Applied Materials, MasterCard, American Express, and Ameriprise. They earned an A- minus or better grade. The companies with the best combination of recent dividend increases and potential of future dividend increases are Bristol-Myers, Applied Materials, Lamb Research, MasterCard, American Express, Raymond James, Visa, and Ameriprise. On this slide, we are looking at stocks that have raised their dividends recently. The holy grail of investing in dividend paying stocks is to have the portfolio generate enough dividends to cover your annual expenses, a level I've reached despite being on a teacher salary. Historically, dividend paying companies raise their dividends by 5 to 6% per year, which is above the historical rate of inflation. This means a stock portfolio can produce the ultimate passive income stream, that being one that increases each year above the rate of inflation. Last week, we had Broad Ridge Financial announcing they will increase their dividend by 10%, and the last 17 dividend increases for the portfolio have an average of 18%. This slide shows stocks in our portfolios that have chosen to split their stocks. Since we keep track of every individual purchase in Excel, it's important that we have this slide to remind us to go back and adjust the purchase price, shares held, and the dividends per share that we've received once a stock split has occurred. Here's a look at the top, here are a look at the 10 stocks that make up the largest portion of the, of the dividend growth portfolio as of Sunday. Our top 10 holdings list did not change much this week as Allegiant and MasterCard remain at the top. Remember, our goal is to build a conservative and diversified portfolio by limiting the amount we invest into one single company. Aggressive investors might not want to limit the investment into any one stock, but I'm a conservative investor, therefore we temporarily stop investing in a company if they make up more than 4% of our portfolio. This leads to a less risky, more diversified portfolio. It's true that our portfolio's returns would likely be higher, if we always invest in our top 10 stocks, regardless of the size of the stock's portfolio allocation, but that also creates a more concentrated, more volatile portfolio. And many investors can't psychologically stick with a volatile portfolio, like those who bailed out of stocks two weeks ago because Monday was a bad day. Volatility often causes investors to panic and sell at the worst time possible. Our portfolio holdings are 97 now with the addition of MSCI to the portfolio. That might seem like a large number of companies to keep track of, but the spreadsheet we've developed for tracking the companies makes it obvious when to sell a company once we download company financial and accounting information into the spreadsheet, which we do at least weekly and doesn't take much time. Now, it did take me about two years to develop the spreadsheet, but once you get it up and going, it's, it's pretty easy to use. 
Now let's talk about our high yield dividend paying stock portfolio. I've had several older students who are closer to retirement take my classes. They are more interested in stocks with higher dividend yields and asked to start a portfolio using a strategy featuring stocks with higher yields than the stocks in our dividend growth portfolio. So in August of 2023, we started investing $12.50 each week into stocks with higher dividend payouts. The portfolio as a whole has an annualized total return of 32.14%. Since the portfolio has been in existence for 12 and a half months, that return will likely fluctuate a lot, a lot more than the return of our dividend growth stock portfolio, which has existed for over two and a half years. Currently, the high yield portfolio's dividend yield is 4.23%, but the companies in it likely won't grow their dividends as much as the stocks in their dividend growth stock portfolio. Therefore, this portfolio would be geared more toward investors closer to retirement. Having said that, many stocks in the portfolio have increased their dividends, pushing the portfolio's yield based on the amount we've invested to 4.9%. Now, two strategies are being implemented in this portfolio, as you'll see on the next few slides. Strategy one emphasize, emphasizes a high dividend yield over dividend growth. Strategy two also features high, excuse me, higher yielders, but places a bit more emphasis on recent dividend growth in an attempt to try to get the best of both worlds, that being high yield and dividend growth. Strategy two so far is a better performer, likely because of the good performance of the utility stocks in it lately. Strategy one has no utility stocks. The average investment in strategy two has provided a total return of 15.47% and has been held for an average of 166 days so far, which is an annualized return of 37.1% using Excel's rate function. Now it's not likely that the portfolio can keep up an, an annualized return that high since stocks historically average nine to 10% each year. And finally, on this slide, we're looking at the high yield dividend paying stocks we bought this week. One thing that's different about this higher yield strategy versus our dividend growth strategy on the previous slides is we only purchase eight stocks and we have two different strategies as we mentioned on the previous slide. Strategy one emphasizes a high dividend yield over dividend growth. This is perfect for investors in retirement or getting close. Strategy two still emphasizes high dividend yield, but places a bit more emphasis on recent dividend growth in an attempt to try to get the best of both worlds. Because there are two different strategies, we have four stocks in strategy one and four stocks in strategy two, giving us two rankings. So each week we take $12.50 and split it between the eight stocks. So each stock gets a one eighth weighting. Having two strategies with one, within one portfolio means that a stock could appear in both strategy one and strategy two. And I believe this week they're identical, but they just have a different order. So if that's the case where a stock appears in both strategies, instead of the stock getting a one eighth weighting, they get two eighths, which is one quarter, which is equivalent to 25% of that week's investment. Both strategies still only invest in high quality stocks, meaning a quality rating of B minus or better. The four high yield dividend stocks we bought this week while implementing strategy one are Bristol Myers, Chevron, PNC Financial, and Morgan Stanley. And then for strategy two, they're the same. They just happen to be the same companies. It's the first time that's happened, but in a different order. This week's purchases have an average yield of 4.3% with Bristol Myers coming in at the highest with a 5.1% dividend yield. And here is a look at our ratings for competitive advantages, management and financial health. And on this slide, we can see their grade for recent dividend growth and current yield, as well as recent dividend growth history. And in the last column, you can see their grades for dividend growth potential, which will be much lower than the stocks in our dividend growth portfolio, which consists of stocks with usually lower yields, but a greater potential for excellent future growth and those dividend payouts. So in the comments, let me know if you have any questions and also let me know what other type of investing videos you'd like to see. Finally, here are the places you can reach me, YouTube obviously, as well as X and LinkedIn and my website, beatthestockmarket.com. I'll see you again next weekend with a list of stocks we will have purchased on Monday. See ya.